Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to answer that musical question that I know has been nagging at all of you. Are Spohr's overtures any better than his symphonies? The reason we ask this is because, you know, we did a chat about Spohr's symphonies and about how uninteresting most of them are. And one of you said, well, the overtures are really much better. Well, no. They're not, I'm sorry to say. Um, they have all of the defects of the symphonies, but in a smaller space, whereas the symphonies are broad swaths of musical inhibition. The overtures are tiny little nuggets of musical inhibition. This particular disc, which is quite well done, it's very nice, features the Berlin Radio Symphony under Christian Froelich um, on CPO, and there are eight overtures we begin with Macbeth. Can you believe it? Spohr actually did a Macbeth. Here's a guy who has no business touching Shakespeare. I mean, really, Macbeth, one of the grimmest, bloodiest of all the Shakespeare tragedies. It has supernatural elements. It's got battles. It's got murders. It's got, you know, you can't be gory or crazy enough in dealing with Macbeth. Would you even know that this is about Macbeth? Well, he does notice that maybe he should put it in a minor key. But the problem with this overture, really, and the problem with most of these overtures, is that in, in shorter forms, Spohr ends just as soon as he seems to be getting started. It's not that it needs to be longer, it's that his sense of climax and proportion is totally out of whack. It just noodles around, kind of doing introductory things. You hear a theme, then you hear a counter theme, then the theme comes back, then the other theme comes back. And then just as it rises to a climax and you think, aha, finally Macbeth, maybe something's happening, it just stops. That's it, stops, cut off. And you move on to something else. And as far as like emotional temperature, well, we're, we're on the Kelvin scale here. Um, it, we, 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 are, we begin at absolute zero, and we work up to maybe the temperature at which, um, you know, the new type of semiconductor, or what, the, what are they called, superconductor things operate. We're talking about, well, maybe five Kelvin. You know what I mean? Bose-Einstein uh, condensate temperatures here in terms of emotional power? Ugh, no. Next, we have a, 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 an overture called Die Prüfung, the exam, the test, something like that. I don't know, whatever it is. But the fun thing about Die Prüfung is that this is much more of Spohr's angle. I mean, it has charm. It really does. Although, <clears throat> although here, we're beginning to already encounter what I call the revenge of the appoggiatura. Second subjects that all do the same thing melodically. You know, it's, it's like, it, 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 it's, it's those melodies that always end with a yada, you know? The most famous one is in Rienzi. Ba -da -dum, ba -da -dum, ba -ba -dum. That's a yada. Every lyrical tune by Spohr does that. It becomes sort of a whining, annoying, um, really irritatingly effeminate effect. And you hear, the, you hear it in most of these overtures. I can't quote a particular tune because they're so unmemorable, but they all do that or most of them do that, a couple of them don't. So, I mean, you know, there are exceptions, thank God. Then we get Alruna die, die Eulenkönigin. Oh my goodness, Alruna die Eulenkönigin. Well, whoever she was, the Eulenkönigin, she must have been one dull broad, let me tell you. She just mopes along, and then of course we have Faust. Now. Spohr was about as capable of doing Faust as he was Macbeth. He should never touch Shakespeare. He should never touch Goethe. He should never touch Schiller. I mean, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. Unbelievably dull. Oh, my God. Okay, so there's Faust, which is five minutes and 55 seconds of utter nothingness. Jessonda, the overture to his opera, which, as some of you pointed out, is not the worst thing he wrote. It's not entirely terrible. I mean, I've heard it. I mean, it has its moments. 
Um, it has piccolos, it has a little percussion in it, it has like a march tune. He actually is noticing the plot. And, you know, while he notices the plot in a way which, again, keeps the emotional temperature in a rather placid, mellow kind of space, um, he does notice it, and the overture does do that. So Jasanda was not the biggest disaster here. Then we have Der Berggeist. Ooh, the mountain spirit. Uh, now forget it. I mean, you know, come on. Then Pietro von Abano. Well, Pietro was also about as exciting as Alruna, the Eulenkönigin. I mean, it just, just... Pietro obviously had nothing much happening in his life. I think he played cards. Maybe that was what was going on in this overture. And the best, we say for last, Der Alchemist. Well, it's the best because it's eight minutes long. He actually has time to develop something, and it actually rises to a climax, which then immediately makes a diminuendo and stops. But yes, it's a surprise ending. The orchestra rears up and goes, Wah! and then it sort of dribbles away. So that was exciting. I mean, it has it has a couple really healthy interventionist moments. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's really good. And, and, you know, it's probably the best of all the overtures. But will you remember these? I doubt it. Are they wonderful pieces of music? Oh, hell no. <laughs> I mean, they're okay. They're okay. I mean, you know, they're, they're pleasant. It's like everything Spore wrote. You, you know, you never wrote an ugly note. They're well orchestrated, but thematically memorable or dramatically exciting or expressively intense. You must be kidding. So there you go. Spore's overtures. Try them if you like. They are, you know, at least shorter than the symphonies. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.